For many years now, Russ and Craig have had many wide-ranging conversations with folks from all over the gaming world. This is one of those conversations. D6G, the Lost Chapter. Hey, so do you have any of the uh, Valentine's Day donuts left over? Because I like the little heart-shaped donut. I'm still fascinated by how they... It doesn't do taste any different. He no, just likes the shape I of like the donut. I like how it looks. And there's not uh, really... See, to me, it reminds me that it's bad for your heart. <laughs> well, maybe. See. But is there any... <laughs> is it too soon for the uh, St. Patrick's Day donut? What would the St. Patrick's Day donut I don't be? Know, mint? Maybe a little mint in there? Like a kind minty like a green, you get, get, uh, yeah, you got to get green, and you don't want like I, rot green yeah, or mo- you know they, mold green. McDonald's did research with NASA to develop a new straw to properly slurp a shamrock shake. Did you see this? No. Yes. So they, they, the, the shamrock shake, the new one, is so thick uh-huh. that they realized that their traditional McDonald's straw would not be functional. So they, which did is research. bizarre, because that is a wide straw. It is, but they've done research. Which, by the way, is another article about why soda tastes better at McDonald's and it's to do with things like the straw being extra wide and the way they wow. mix the carbon. But anyway, long story short, uh, <laughs> the, they've invented a new straw. It's only available certain days, uh, very limited quantities, but it's got this weird curve at the end with a double entrance thing to slurp huh. in uh, and allow more air to get the proper pressure ratio for proper shamrock shake consumption. Really? Yeah, it's a thing. Hmm. Uh, so anyway. All right. Uh, speaking of strange things, uh, have you been reading uh, any good books lately, Craig? Because I have. It's been a while here in Dunkin' Donuts since we talked about sort of the. I know we've done some some lost chapters on books you must read, or sort of good fantasy books that we recommend, or good sci fi books. Yeah, it's been a while. But I don't know if we've updated the list, you know, any time recently. And I feel like, you know, um, we've been doing some reading since last we spoke about this. And it probably yep. might, you know, while we're waiting for our uh, mint donuts, which the more mm. I say that, the more it sounds not as good as it did in my Yeah, I don't, I, don't <laughs> think I, I don't think I ordered a, uh, a mint donut, I don't believe. <laughs> I kind of want one. Maybe just a coffee today. Um, so I kind of <laughs> think, um, so what have you been reading lately, Craig? I'm going to bring up my list here on Audible uh, and see if I can look at some of the more recent books that I've, uh, I've read here. Let me see. Oh, indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, well, I mean, as I've been mentioning ongoing in Achievements, um, the latest books of The Expanse, not to be confused with uh, The Abyss, mm-hmm. um, are really where where my focus and attention has been because I just think these latest two books, I, like I, um, I mean, I loved the first three books, mm-hmm. and uh, and then um, it kind of it kind of went. I mean, I still loved it. You're still with the same characters. They're still awesome. There's nothing that rings untrue about that that uh that fourth book i believe it's the fourth book um but these two neck the t- these two latest books which add a whole new story arc and still all the other cool stuff is going on but these these two things are really um these two books like really like change everything up churn them up if you will if you're up on the uh up on the lingo or the short stories hmm. um I just love them, and that's of course Babylon's Ashes and uh, Nemesis games, um, and uh, and I, I I mean they're just they've got great narrator and everything. But if you're talking about just the books, they're great stories. They've got great characters, as you already know. The technology's awesome. They've laid the foundation for everything else, and they've had a whole new story basically laid on top of that awesome foundation for these last two books. So uh, that's where I uh, like a lot of my focus has been recently uh, with those books, science fiction wise. Your turn. Uh, sure. Well, so I mentioned this in the main show, but I thought it's been a little more time on this. So I discovered a series of books. Uh, my oldest daughter started reading them, too, and it's called The uh, Pillars of Reality by Jack Campbell. So um, this is a series of books that he's done for, um, you know, young adults uh, and these are, they follow the tale of a mage and a mechanic. And so it's a universe that's, um, well, it's, it's kind of like a steampunk fantasy universe where there is technology um, and there's rifles and pistols and things, but there's also magic. Uh, and there's these two great guilds, the Mechanics Guild, which is the Technology Guild, and there's the Mage Guild, which is the Magic Guild. And these two guilds hate each other's guts, but they basically rule the world. 
and everyone else, the commons, are kind of like um, sub- submissive to them. Uh, and it's the story of, um, well, is everything both these guilds do for the best and what's really wrong? And it follows these two people, this mage and mechanic, who sort of become uh, friends and then start to understand that maybe not everything they say about each other is each other's guilds is, is true. Um, but there's some interesting, cool things about particularly how the mages work. So for the magic to work, the mages have to believe everyone else is a shadow uh, on an, a, the grand illusion that is the world. And they are the only reality the, the the mage himself or herself is the only reality. And because everything they see is an illusion, their spells are just imagining the illusion changing to be the way you imagine it. And that's how the spell works. So if you want a, fireball to explode there you just got to change reality there's one scene where there's a ship attacking them and he just changes reality so that there's a bit missed missing from the mast and the mast falls over <laughs> in the ship you know so that kind of thing but but what's interesting about that is he starts to realize that well that if everybody's an illusion and everybody's fake then how is this mechanic woman affecting the world around me and how and so he starts to question the philosophy of that and yet, if he starts to disbelieve that, will he still be able to cast his spells? Meanwhile, the mechanic has been taught that, and mechanics are like true engineers. Like they, you know, like, well, we would define engineers, and they have guns, and, and they have steam boilers, and they have, you know, computational machines, kind of like, you know, rough computers and things like that. And they're like, well, this, this mage thing can't possibly exist. It doesn't follow any of the laws of physics. That's all fake. But then she, she actually sees him starting to do magic, and she's like, well, how can that, how can that even, what? The, why does that even work? And so you start to, and so you're, and so what's neat about the books in particular is the the world building happens very incrementally and very slowly uh, in a very nice way. And I think Jack Campbell does a really good job of that. That appeals to me as an adult, but also my daughter uh, as a teenager mm-hmm. is really enjoying it as well. So I really can't recommend these highly enough. There's, I think, like six, I'm on book four now in the series. And I think there is, I'm going to look it up right on Audible right now. There is, there are six books currently published with the most recent book having come out just this past August. Um, so it's a very active series. And I don't think this book is the, the most recent book is the final book either. So um, good stuff. So I'm really enjoying those good, good mm, fun reads. Cool. What else you got in your list there, Craig? Uh, well, now I'm bouncing into uh, what they call, I believe, the, uh, the whole urban fantasy, mm-hmm. which would be the same sort of category as the... Um, the Dresden Files, and I'm talking about the Shadow Police that Ooh, I've yes. talked about on the show by by Paul Cornell. And this is, of course, uh, there is a reality. I mean, there's magic in the reality, and there's creatures, and there's gods, and there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, and most of us can't see it. We don't experience it. So it's very similar to Dresden, except it's much darker. Um, there, there are these dark powers that are basically preying on normal people on a regular basis and this police this undercover police unit gets wrapped up in it by accident and basically uh discovers the 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 the, this reality and starts to specialize through self-defense um in fighting this this society they uncover this whole secret society they find out that these people there's people who can do magic all over the place uh, it's sort of like a dark Harry Potter, maybe a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, and some of it is very, very dark. The first book, London Falling, is very, very dark. And then the second book, which is, um, is uh, I can't remember what the second book is called. Uh, what's the second? The Severed Streets is the one where they're using meth to stay awake. So mm-hmm. that got dark and weird. And uh, and then the third book, Who Killed Sherlock Holmes, I thought really hit a sweet spot. There wasn't really that much darkness. There was some because it's you know there's bad stuff happening. Not a lot of weird like like I like I'm questioning your like actual interpretation of our reality that kind of thing. Um, and it was very cool because it all wrapped up around this idea that uh, Sherlock that that basically there's a, a belief system that the whole story kind of rests upon, which is what the majority of people believe has power and, and has as strength. And so because so many people enjoy Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes in some strange way is real. Oh, right. And, and because there's so many Sherlock Holmes and it was really a cool play with modern pop culture because mm-hmm. there's so many real Sherlock Holmes TV shows going on right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they like the, the 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 Sherlock Holmes, the sort of metaphysical Sherlock Holmes, was in flux, 
<laughs> and was in transition, constantly shifting. And I mean, it doesn't parallel reality exactly. There was one version, the, like the they keep they keep calling it the Amer- the American version of the story where Sherlock Holmes is a ma- is a woman, mm-hmm. and so that was causing all kinds of uh, like tension right. also right. in the in the whole thing. So it's really really cool. And of course, someone. Well, who killed Sherlock Holmes? That's actually a philos- uh, a question in philosophy class, by the way. Russ, Russ, yes. Who killed Sherlock Holmes? Uh, well, it's generally thought that Moriarty killed Sherlock Holmes. No, but I would argue that Sherlock Holmes is not even dead. Uh-huh. He's alive in all of our hearts, solving okay. problems even as we speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the answer technically is Arthur Conan Doyle. Oh well, yes, he's the writer, but that's yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but in uh, actuality, he couldn't be dead because he was never alive. Okay. Oh, now we're getting metaphysical. Now we're getting deep. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so yeah. So I mean, if the whole meth thing, the meth, the only thing that might cause you a little discomfort, it did for me, was that whole let's use meth to keep ourselves awake. Um, otherwise, I, I highly recommend this uh, this series. I think he's got great um, characters really a lot of depth to the characters. You really care about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, They get into all kinds of emotional turmoil at the same time. They're learning about all this new stuff and they're trying. One guy is really trying to, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm not really good at fighting. I'm not really good at going undercover because I get nervous. So I'm going to learn as much about this society and magic as I can. So he's like, I'm going to be the point guy on the magic. And sometimes that works great. And sometimes it doesn't work great. And then there's the guy in charge, and then there's this woman who's technically their superior and sort of knows what they're doing and kind of says, you do what you got to do, but I don't understand it. And then you find it like, what's her backstory? So there's a lot of rich background that gets revealed slowly over these first three novels, and I'm hoping there's a lot more coming. I know there's at least one more coming. Nice. Um, And it doesn't really kind of – there's a huge – reveal in book three where you're because you're like okay it's cool it's going along and then a lot of these series eventually devolve into you know the whole world is about to end and, i mean that's kind of what happened with monster uh with monster hunters inc right, right. it be, it got like every mo- every book they're fighting a bigger monster until eventually okay so basically cthulhu's here can we banish cthulhu and once you've done that what's the bo- oh we'll start doing pre uh, prequels okay good right. um this book hasn't reached that yet but it has gotten into a really high stakes environment in the third book so uh a lot to like there um uh, and that's by Paul Cornell. All right, nice. Over to you, Russ. Well, let's see. Um, I'm going to stick in my little fantasy realm here. I think I think today I'm going to be talking mostly about fantasy books for those. Okay. Um, so another series of books that both my oldest daughter and I really enjoy, and I've mentioned them on the main show a couple of times, is um, Gail Carriger has done now three different series of books in this universe. Um, and I don't know which universe we should call it. She's got the three different series, but I call I call the whole thing the Parasol Protectorate universe. And I've I've talked about this before. It basically follows um, primarily female protagonists. Uh, the initial series, which is the first book series she wrote, but it's not the first chronological series. Uh, the Parasol Protectorate uh, follows the story of a woman who lives in Victorian England, but it's an alternate history uh, where werewolves and vampires are rear, real and well-established members of society. So uh, vampire, you know, the queen has a shadow counselor, the queen of England, and the shadow council consists of a vampire and a werewolf, uh, and they work with her to take care of issues, uh, whatever kind of issues they need to be taken care of. They are there for her. Uh-huh. Um, as well as, and but in addition to these two types of people, she, uh, the main character, has a special power as well, um, and you learn that throughout the books. Uh, what's really a lot of fun about this is there it's it's a light there's a little bit of romance in here but they're not really I wouldn't call or qualify these as romance novels but there's a lot of that kind of thing going on but I really like the the political intrigue and the sort of the the dialogue and the characters are are, are great and the author uh, Gail Carriger has a lot of fun with crazy names it's sort of her mm-hmm. trademark and so the names of many of the characters are just plain silly but in sort of like a Douglas Adams sort of fun way cool. um, and I think she she manages to capture some of that sort of classic uh, English humor, although I don't think she's English, but she has that sort of that spirit <laughs> of that in there along with her stories. And so the, the, the other two series that are really good, uh, the Finishing School series, which takes place before the Parasol Protectorate, is her young adult series. So that series is a prequel to Parasol Protectorate. If you wanted to read the books in the order that things take place in her world, you'd start with that. 
Uh, it's very good. I enjoyed it as well. Um, but the the parasol protector itself is targeting adults, uh, and that follows the the adventures of the people one generation later than the finishing school, um, or actually the people in the finishing school as they grew up. And then the latest series, uh, The Custard Protocol, follows the adventures of the daughter of the main character in Parasol Protectorate as now she goes out on adventures. But what's really kind of fun about these three books is you also see, because they're each a generation later, you see how the world is changing. And she also world world builds outside. So in the first couple series, it's really going what's going on in England with hints of how in the United States things are happening. So in the U.S., vampires are not accepted into society. They're hunted. So it's almost uh-huh. like a civil war is over the vampires kind of thing. Meanwhile, in uh, in the third series, the main character there gets a dirigible and starts traveling the world, and you start to learn about what the supernatural stuff is like in other parts of the world, like India, India and the Far East. Um, so it's really interesting to see that, too. So she does some nice world building that way also. So I really enjoy those. Um, the first two series are complete. Finishing School is done, and Parasol Protectorate is finished. They cannot go any farther. Um, but the... Uh, Custer Protocol is only in book two now, and she's saying that's going to be a four to five book arc as well. So still mm-hmm. lots of great reading there. So if that's your thing, and I know it's, a, it's kind of not going to be for everybody, um, but I like it, and I think uh, most uh, female readers will also enjoy it, and that is uh, Gail Carriger's Parasol Protectorate and other related series. Cool. What else you got there, Craig? Uh, what do I got? Well, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i go into some fantasy. Uh, right. there you go. I'll see your fantasy. All right. Uh, and I will go to the Joe Abercrombie series, uh, The Shattered Sea. See, now I need to read this. I have not read yes, this yet. Yes, you do. i got to go put this on my yep. list right now. If you're a fan of Joe Abercrombie, you have to go run out right now and do it, especially if you like Vikings, and Russ is in a oh, Vikings phase, phase right now. Okay? If you, in, if you sort of enjoyed Joe Abercrombie but thought he was too nihilistic and too dark, then you definitely have to jump in on this because he's bringing the same strength, the same character, the same themes uh, – not themes, but the same strong storytelling, but not quite as dark and, uh, and gritty as his um, first law books and the, now, and the other books that take place in that universe. So I'm on Audible now. Is there? Yes. It, there's a book called Half a King. Yep. Shattered Sea, Book One. That's it. Now, is there a book two? Because there's another book called Half the World. That is a. That's the next book. Okay. Because it doesn't say book two. Oh, there it does. And then there's another book called Half a War. Is that book three? That is. Got it. So there's three books. And is there more coming, or is that the? Is it? Self- nope. That's it. That's right, the whole. I mean, the, he might write in that universe again, yeah. but that's the whole story. Cool. All right, these all came out. Yep. Oh, they all came out last year, or most of them did. Yeah, and and I'll tell you, they're short. Yeah, they're way shorter than the first law books. Yeah, and that kept me from them for quite a while because mm-hmm. I I guard those credit credits, you know, very carefully. Right. But eventually, I think I got one on a sale. You know, uh, you know, Audible's always doing their sales. Mm-hmm. I, I think they got me on one sale. It was like five bucks for the uh, for the first book, and then I jumped in on the second two. And uh, or it, it was like Karen gave them to me as a gift or something. Uh, and I loved them, loved them, loved them, loved them there. Yeah. It's uh, it's an it's 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 very cool because it may or may not be happening in our future. Ooh, neat. That's the cool thing. And you never really find out. I mean, you kind of you can guess and everybody can have their own opinion. And I won't give you my opinion because I don't want that to spoil any one th- anything one way or the other. But you have the old gods and you have the elves who no longer exist, but they existed once. And there are, you know, elven cities and elven ruins and elven technologies. Um, and you have wizards, but do they have real magic or are they doing, you know, it's all kinds of cool stuff. They're very Viking oriented um, in their in their uh, in their origins. Um, and you've got, uh, it's, it, I, I loved it. it. I mean, the, he's so good at doing characters. So right. good. You cool. feel for these characters, you want them to succeed. Oh, to and at note. the same time, what in these books, there's a lot, there's a journey aspect to there's almost like a questing aspect to the overall story arc so that he covers a lot of this world. There's a lot of traveling, there's a bringing a Viking long show, excuse me, a, a long ship of possibly Viking origin over a mountain at one point, uh, over a mountain pass. And and uh, and of course, it is Joe Abercrombie. So there will be some death 
<laughs> so brace yourself. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but it's not quite the whole, you know, um, death for nothing every now and then that you get in the other books. Um, and each book in is comes from a different character's perspective, but they're all interweaving into one overarching story, which I thought was really cool also. Uh, I at first I didn't think I was going to like it. I didn't realize what was happening. The first book is all from one guy's point of view, and then the ver- the second book starts and it's not from his point of view. And you're like, what's going on? But then you find out where that character ties in with the first character, and it's 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 really well done. It's very clever storytelling. The story is great. The characters are great. Um, it was it was a real win for me. I really enjoyed it. Um, I highly recommend it. There you go. Yeah. All right. So my next one also fantasy, but I'm going to change this category from fantasy to gamer book. So oh, okay. uh, I've talked about these in the show as well. I cannot recommend these books highly enough. Craig, have you read either Into the Storm or Into the Wild yet? Uh, no. Okay. So you should read these books. They take place in the War Machine universe. They are part of the Privacy Privateer Press uh, library. However, uh, Skull Island stuff. But yep. they're by Larry Coria. Uh, oh, there you go. So I would say the um, most of the books in the Skull Island thing are fun reads, light reads. If you're a fan of War Machine and Hordes, you know, any of them you'd probably enjoy. Some are, you know, they're, but most of them are kind of what you'd expect for, and I don't mean to, you know, pick on anyone, but they're, they're kind of what, you, you know, they, what you'd expect for game-related IP typically. However, yeah. I would say the Larry Coria stuff is transcends the genre i think if you are interested in fantasy books uh you should read these and if you have any passing associated with war machine you'll like it even more so into the storm i would say is the dirty dozen meets the storm knights from Uh signar so you Uh essentially have a band of storm knights who are the rejects the 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 washouts essentially the the worst people in the army signarian army but it's in the height of the uh, the battles with the protector of men off and they need everybody they can get. So they go ahead and deploy these guys, even though they're completely incompetent, they give them no proper equipment, no proper anything. And somehow this unit who happens to be led by a reject general, but he's been really rejected politically. He's really a good commander and a very smart tactician, um, gets them together, knows enough people to get at least decent supplies, including one half crazed war Jack and they go at it. And it is just so well written and so fun and so character driven. You really care about these guys. Um, even more, you know, the fact that it's taking place in the War Machine universe is almost secondary to that. It's it's a lot, a lot of fun. And then what they did with Into the Wild, they took one of the secondary and quirky kind of fun characters from Into the Storm, made him the primary character Into the Wild, and now um, this a small unit from the unit that you grew to love in the first book is now a small subset of them. They've been deployed on this crazy mission in the middle of nowhere in the wilds, because there's rumors of problems, but they're not really problems. It is on this research mission with some of the scientists of Signar, and it turns out most of Signar doesn't know the Circle of Orberos is real. And uh-huh. all of a sudden, you start running into the various parts of the Circle of Orberos and start understanding that, and it's really well done. Uh, and again, if you don't know anything about War Machine, you will totally love these books. It doesn't matter. And you might even be sucked into the War Machine universe this way. And if you do, you'll like them. Um, I would really can't recommend these enough uh you know i'm a big fan of larry Coria anyway i've read a lot of his other stuff um so if you like him you'll like if you're also a larry Coria fan you really owe it to yourself so these two books are related definitely read into the storm first and then read into the wild second um and they've both been so good i would be very surprised if if, if larry didn't do another one uh but uh, both really really good stuff cool you got another one on your, on your list craig i got one more after this one what do you got okay i can uh, well i can go a couple different directions all right, all right. Um, and I, just so you know, uh, like I'm not just saying off, everything's awesome. I'm skipping over things I didn't enjoy. Mm-hmm. I have uh, and th- and th- there was a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I failed to become a big fan of, uh, can't even find them cause I've been accidentally put pushing buttons. Ken Liu. I didn't really enjoy the grace of Kings series. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did not enjoy really the the Hero of Ages. Um, I can't remember what the series, but Brandon Sanderson's, and I'm I, I think I'm alone in that one because I think a lot of uh, our friends enjoyed that series. Um, but the, it's the Mistborn. That's it, the Mistborn series. I enjoy his other books and his other serieses. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all giant and huge and epic. Uh, but for some reason, the the Mistborn thing didn't really hit me. But you know what? The la- the, the 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 I'll talk a little bit about um, the Witcher books. Oh yes, those are good. Yeah, that's how that's how far back I have now gotten in yeah, my. I read those. Those are awesome. In my in my in my reading list, um, I really really enjoyed them. They're right. translations. Uh, it doesn't matter. They translated the, very well. The original yeah. books by Andrew uh, Sapkowski, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I love the story. I love the characters. I love the writing. Great fantasy, a great twist on fantasy. Again, I mean, because of the nature of achievements in gaming, we've talked about all this before, but reiterating a very, very strong um, uh, Peter Kenny, the, uh, the the narrator, does a great job if you're talking audible. Uh, the books can't be bad if you're reading, you know, in the old fashioned way. Um, I just really enjoyed them and enjoyed the characters. And it's very rare because, as you know, Russ, you get all excited about these video games. You tell me about the plots. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. I go out by the books and it's like crap mm-hmm. because the books are always what happens between the amazing move, the amazing video games. Right. So they're pay- they're spending millions of dollars and getting millions and hundreds of millions of dollars back on the video game. So they don't want to give that story away. So they don't. Instead, they give you the connective tissue between, you know, Dawn of War one and Dawn of War two or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so instead of the awesome arching story that you get, generally you're getting like these background stories or the connective Mm -hmm. tissue. And how did this end of this game start the next game? And, and that's not what you get. The Witcher books are actually, from what I understand, the, the story of, Geralt is that his name? Yes, Geralt. And Geralt. Yeah. And um and 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 his actual story which I loved. Well, the books predate the game. So the games are based on Oh, do books, Oh, do they? Oh, well, that, why, that would be you, why. You wouldn't know it because the English translations are relatively recent. But right. the original books in their source language which I believe is Czechoslovakian, I think or something. Um they are the games are based on that, and those books were published some time ago, like the '90s or something. Yeah. So the games are based on that, which is why. And the games aren't; they're based on stories after the books. So the games, which is kind of interesting, the games extend some oh, of the stories. Polish, yeah. yeah, Polish. There it is. So yeah. they extend some of that. They don't um, replace it. So the books. What's great about them is they sort of the books are sort of like prequels to the game. Now I I say that I played The Witcher three only the video game. I haven't played the earlier Witcher books, yeah. Witcher video games, which may have been direct transitions of the books. I don't know, but uh, the Witcher three game, which is the only one I played, sort of is after the books, which is fun because if you read the books, it's like more experiences in that great world. Um, but you're totally right, Craig. They completely, obviously, stand on their own because they they uh, they yep, predate yep. games. I did, yeah. Uh, I I didn't know or had forgotten that. Yeah. So they're, but I love them. I love the the characters are fantastic. The, the main character, all the side characters, um, you know, um, just wonderful, wonderful stuff, and and hilariously well written. Great dialogue, and uh, every once in a while, there's a little fairy tale, a nod to you know Grimm's. Uh, tales thrown in there, uh, uh, sort of from a side angle that you didn't expect, which is kind of fun too. So yep. I like those a lot. Uh, let's see. Well, yeah. So that's the. So yeah. So that and there are a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four, five books is what I'm seeing. Yeah. And not uh, oh no, there's one that hasn't been released yet. Well, not released in tr- March 2017. Yeah. Russ. I know. I got to catch up. I've only. Well, when I first got into them, they'd only translated. Um, the Last Wish and The Blood of Elves. So now I can catch up on the other. It looks like three more have been translated since then. Yeah, a yeah. couple just last year. Um, so yeah, I got to get those so I can catch all up. Because some of them on Audible, they have the originals in Polish also. Yes, but you got to be careful. Right, I got I to gotta get them in English because I don't know my Polish. It's a little rusty. So yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah but that's a, that's a great series. Good one. Um, so I have one that, Craig, I think you've read this before. You were not as enamored with this as I was, but... Um, I, and I've talked about this in the main show when I was blasting through these books. I love, 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 uh, and again, another great series that my daughter loved just as much as I did, The Iron Druid Chronicles by Kevin Hart. Yes. So yep. um, these books are, um, they feel a little bit like Harry Dresden in that you have a spell casting person who has been alive a very long, well, I don't know if Dresden's been alive a long time, but this guy's been alive forever um, since the Roman times, right? And he is now, or even before then, actually, and he is now in our modern times, and he's an actual, honest to goodness, spell casting druid, um, but living, you know, unceremoniously in Arizona, uh, basically mm-hmm. running a uh, herb and tea shop, <laughs> you know. Um, but 
um, you know, he's he's kind of in hiding because the fae, uh, the fairies and everything, everything's real, like like Dresden. Um, a lot of things are real. And like you were mentioning earlier, Craig, with your Sherlock Holmes book, Sherlock Holmes is real because enough people believe in his yep. stuff. Uh, right. in the in the Iron Druid Chronicles, all the different pantheons are real because if enough people believe in these gods, they come to be. So, you know, there's the Norse gods are out there and the Greek gods are out there. And of course, the Christian gods are out there and the Muslim, every god, every god is out there somewhere if there's enough people. But there's also different flavors of all the gods. So right. there's the, you know, there's the anglicized version of the Norse gods and there's the Russian version of the thunder god and there's all these other flavors of them and they're more and less powerful depending on how many people worship them and how you know how well beloved they are at the time um, and so meanwhile you've got these druids and other sort of supernatural characters floating around um, but I just really like the writing style I like his character a lot he um, he has this companion Irish wolfhound he happens to be an Irish druid he, he grew up in as uh, he's an ancient Celt, technically, so he is very strongly into Ir- Ir- Irish legend and lore, and it's a big part of the books. Um, the author uh, Kevin Aaron Harn does a very good job with the research and everything; really makes it interesting and compelling. But he hangs out with this Irish wolfhound, and because he's a druid, he can communicate with him and, and speak to him in his mind. And the the, the dog is his name is Oberon. It's hilarious, um, really, really funny. Um, so the whole books are just a lot of fun. Um, and again, they get into really interesting stuff. He has a really cool, the way the Druid spell casting system works, I think is also really compelling. Um, he has to like be in touch with the ground to power himself. And when he's not in touch with the ground, like if he's on asphalt or wearing shoes, um, he has these amulets and things uh, or a necklace, I guess it is that he can transfer some power into and temporarily store it up. And since he's been alive so long, he's built up all these defenses and mechanisms to be able to do battle with the various God forces. Um, there's some just really interesting stuff. Apparently Thor is this big jerk and everybody in the, in the magical universe kind of hates Thor. Uh, so he's constantly dealing with that. It's just, really... he's a bad roommate. Have you seen those little videos <laughs> yes, online? Yes. Thor is a bad roommate. <laughs> so Thor, and they, they talk about this too. Cause like, it's like, you'll say like, Thor's a, Thor's a jerk, and he's like, "What do you mean? He's not like you see in the comic book. That's not Thor. You know, that's, that Thor's nice. I've actually met him. He's okay. I'm talking about the Thor from the actual Norse times. That guy's a jerk, you know. And it's just this whole thing. So, really, 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 uh, I just really enjoy these books. There's like a gajillion of them. I think they're up to like, um, I don't know, uh, eight or so. Um, and my daughter really likes them as well. And and I know a lot of you our listeners out there are parents like myself and. What I, I really enjoy being able to read books and series that my daughters also enjoy because it means you know, more things to talk about and shared experiences. So, um, you know, again, the, the Gail Carriger books, the Kevin Harn books, there's a few others that, um, you know, for some reason there's been books that I really enjoyed as a kid that aren't, they're not getting into as much. I don't know. My, my daughters, you know, they saw Lord of the Rings. They didn't get into it. Um, uh, my youngest likes Harry Potter. My oldest, eh, take it or leave it. But... Um, some of these other series that we found more recently, they, we all love reading them and sharing the stories and talking about how we enjoyed them. So, uh, so the Iron Druid is one of those books that just works. My youngest daughter, now it's interesting that my oldest daughter loves the Iron Druid, could care less about Harry Dresden. Youngest daughter mm-hmm. doesn't like the Iron Druid, loves Harry Dresden. So, you know, ah, well, there, there you go. We can share. Uh, I guess Kid depends, after my own heart. I guess right it there. depends on your, on your favorite flavor, chocolate or vanilla there or uh, wizard or druid i don't know yeah and um, i should say i don't dislike these i just, yeah. i find i don't like them as much as dresden so i don't see them as a really good like kind of alternative to dresden but they're fine for a you know when there's no yeah, dresden I don't, I don't know if they're i i think they're far enough apart for i only compare it to dresden because it's similar where you got this out of time sort of right you know, yeah it's a whole world. genre but i yeah, exactly I right because because arguably even even the gale carriage stuff is similar where you you're in this oh that's you know, never mind. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's um, yeah, I, I, it doesn't feel, to me, they feel different enough, uh, but it's similar in that you got the spellcaster dude. But I, I think their writing styles are very different. Um, you know, yeah, the kind of challenges true. Harry Dresden face are completely different. Uh, very different. So, yeah, I would say they don't, they don't, it doesn't feel like you're reading a Dresden book, except that there's a supernatural spellcaster living in modern times. It's about as close right. as it gets. Yeah. Um, I, 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 so I'll, cool. I'll, I'll buy that for a dollar. So, Phew, I think that's got us pretty caught up, Craig, on what we've been reading, you know, the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, 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 that's probably last year. And... I think we managed to stay fantasy mostly, so i got to read some sci-fi so we can get back in. I know you've been doing no, this I, 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 Yeah, I, th- I don't, yeah. yeah, I think I've, I, it's weird, I go in phases, but lately my phases have not been consistent, so. Yeah, I haven't done enough sci-fi lately, i gotta, I got to. I feel like I'm having with. Well, you got the expanse, man, that's. I know, i got to get back into that. I'm, I'm watching the show, loving the TV show. 
Yeah, um, oh, the the season is great. I know they're doing a great job with it. Um, I still wonder if people who haven't read the book can follow it because they got a lot going on. I'm loving it though. I'm mean, no no uh, no complaints, but um, yeah, I'm, I got to get back into the experience series, especially since now you're saying the latest book is really good. So I'm telling you, the last I'm two a few behind. I'm I'm like three behind, uh, two behind. No, yeah, you've you've read the one where they go to the Illus, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so you're only – so the, what you have ahead of you, Ross, is the best of the best. Ooh, excellent. This well, is what I'm right saying. On. All right, I got to finish these uh, – these, uh, Yeah, finish up your green donut. We got to get okay. going. Okay, all right. Thanks for purchasing a D6G Lost Chapter. Supporting the show helps it grow. 